did you find out about his condition? I'm a wife and also a caregiver to my husband, Darren, who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I found out when he was in his early 30s, and we all know what they say, right, about artists, you know, having their mood swings and stuff like that. But yeah, it wasn't a shock. It's more of a gradual awakening. I was a caregiver to my sister-in-law, Faith, who has uh, bipolar disorder. When I first started dating her sister, her sister briefly uh, informed me of, uh, of her condition. So over the course, Faith herself told me more about, her, about what bipolar was. It's not something that uh, you tell someone and immediately they have a good grasp on. I just saw someone who was obviously feeling very down. Uh, it was, it was uh, quite obvious uh, from the outside. I'm caregiver to my brother who has schizophrenia. Initially, when he started to paint and draw, everybody was very happy and excited for his talents. Uh, but he started to talk to himself. So at first, they thought it's, uh, some spiritual went into his body. Until um, one fine day, there is a group of media that came to our house and start him on this uh, spiritual cleansing. And um, the temple owner did tell my parents that he actually need to see a doctor. I was quite frightened then because um, he was about 13 and I'm only 12. He felt so much pain which I couldn't fathom. I would be hearing him knocking his head against the wall as if uh, screaming for help. So that was symptoms or points that we took note of and that we had to make that decision to get help. Why would you choose to be their caregiver? Well, I'm, uh, they're my family now, so it's part of the deal. Her primary caregiver would be her mother. She's got a huge well of emotional strength, you know, to be there day in, day out, providing uh, support. It's not easy. She has what we call rapid cycling bipolar. So that means her mood switches at a frequency of a couple of weeks or even every week. So you can imagine that's very disruptive. She's very, she's highly intelligent, much smarter than I am, you see. So it's like God has given you a pair of wings, but at the same time, you're shackled to the ground and you can't fly, you see. So I thought that was such a, such a cruel irony. Why did I want to continue caring for him? Because he's my brother, <laughs> right? In my family, I think I'm the only one who are close to him, who uh, we grown up together, and I think I still be able to care for him. The word caregiver, I have a little bit of uh, uneasiness because I really feel that as a uh, a partnership in a marriage or a family, we are each caregivers to each other. You naturally step up, step up to hold the helm. I wear the pants and he wears the apron. So my stepping up would be, how can we then work around um, to survive? Have you ever thought about walking away um, of course, who doesn't, right? I mean, when the pressure gets so, so, so deep, right? I mean, such thoughts like, hey, I'm not your therapist, you know? So, those hard moments can be very draining and I have walked away. But uh, then um, somehow we came back and we tried to work things out. I never thought of walking away. Kalim, to me, is just some character, uh, character problems. He can be very caring and he could be very nasty too. Sometimes he'll try to irritate me by saying something bad. Yeah, but I think that is that's fine. I'm assigned with this responsibility. I have to carry on. As long as I'm around, I think I still can take care of everybody. Basically, because I think she sees me as a brother, uh, so if I were to leave, then it would be basically like your brother walking, leaving the family. You know? I mean, when she was having a really bad episode, it was hard. I mean, even, as a, even for me to, to see that there was any light at the end of the tunnel. 
all of us have external triggers, right? Things that happen to us and then we feel uh, angry or sad or happy. So for a person uh, like Faith, who has bipolar disorder, right? At least for her, I've seen that uh, external triggers trigger an amplified emotional response. We had a family vacation we, uh, in Japan, and then the kids were in the car. And you know how kids are like, right? There's very little peace and quiet, very little sleep. It was cold and we didn't eat on time. Basically, I think this was primarily my fault. I assembled the perfect storm <laughs> for her. La. There was certainly a fallout. La. You just do what you can do. And, or you can try to get better at what you do. I mean, how much time does it take to ask someone how he or she is doing, right? What made me turn back? Um, okay, the fact that um, I care. I just had this conversation with him uh, two days ago, I think. I said, you know what? Love, to say I love you, I really love you, is, uh, it doesn't justify because to me, um, care it encompasses all those feelings. I care. I mean, surely if you have seen the best of someone, you, you just can't walk away. Oh, can he survive without me? Definitely he can. He can make friends with many people. Financially, uh, if he can continue painting, beautiful painting, I believe he can continue um, to support himself. I have reserved some of his painting for his retirement, future retirement use. Career-wise, she's a peer support specialist. She wants specifically to help people uh, who, are some, who are suffering from mental health conditions. She's actually studied, prepared for and applied for uh, a medical degree. You know, and that to me is pretty amazing. I've, I've seen some of her notes. Uh, it, it makes no sense to me. <laughs> you know? yeah, so that's, that, that's an example of her, uh, of her intellect and why I have such a great respect for her brain. For sure, he can survive. I guess as we grow older, you are just going to take a one day at a time. So when Darren talks about uh, suicide, if it were really to happen, um, it's a preparation on my part to believe that I have, uh, as a caregiver, I've done my best and that um, I cannot control situation. So if it does happen, that I am not responsible for it. When was the last time he got admitted into IMH? Oh gosh, okay. I don't think I can remember. I know this one. You know, I know okay. this one. Okay. Hi. Hello, Kali. Hey, boy. What do you do in IMH? I, I do a lot of artwork, but this few weeks go I'm going to do because I, I rest for a while, for one week term, then go back home and do painting. So sometimes I can do a lot, sometimes a little bit. There's an arrangement for him to reintegrate back uh, to society. He'll be home for three weeks and back to IMH for one week. Luckily, he got some work to do there, so, so not too bad. My is inspiration. I draw the uh, yes. pretty egg work. Like. I draw one dragon, one phoenix to my building. Mary is there. Mm. He's also very capable. They allow him to draw on the, on, the, on the whole compound. I was already seeing a doctor there, so... Um, Basically, it's a voluntary admission 15 years ago. Generally, I think Singaporeans think that it's like Ban Chiao Yuan, like Woodbridge Hospital. I mean, now that I'm working there, sometimes we get taxi in or grab in. The taxi driver will ask me, you know, you know, are you working there? Is it scary inside? Kind of thing. I don't know, like, people just think that we shouldn't get help there. Even a lot of people go to private care because of that as well. But that's where the best doctors are. The last was towards the end of. 2010 at Sayang Wellness. I knew I was going to sell this drug. That's why I had to make that conscious decision. At least, if you don't heal completely, you have some peace. Can you snap out of it? Can not. Can not. Can not. Can not. He knows. You might be in that state of manic depression for a month. You know? So the last thing anybody needs is judgment. 
Hey, come on, man. You got a good life. You're so rich. You got money. Why are you... The moment you lose your mind, it doesn't matter whether you're a billionaire. It doesn't matter you have everything in the world. You lose everything. It is a medical condition. If you can step out of cancer, if you can step out of your diabetes, uh, probably I can do that too, but it's not something like that. Like what Adrian said, it's like amplifier. I think that's once that I, I need to go to work and I, by the time I get on the train, I started like regretting because the panic attack symptoms are coming. I can't breathe. You have people like right in your face kind of thing. It can be challenging for the best of us. Yeah, so I just got out. I just sat there and cried for about 45 minutes. Nobody came over and asked me what was going on or offered me anything. I just sat on the floor crying. The, the thing about um, MRT or any public places, right? If you cry, right, you, most of the time you definitely, I, I never actually got any help. But if I start vomiting, people will help me. So if there's a physical symptom, I, I get more help. Mm. I just need to wait for it to like go back to normal. You just have to let it run its course. Lah. I mean, there's a category yeah. of people for whom you can't say, snap out of it, you've got a weak will. It's not the case in this example. Sadly, some give up the fight. You cannot blame them. You know, you cannot judge them for even for suicide, because everybody has a threshold. So I consider myself the veteran of the minefield, a survivor. If I make it through today, that's a small victory for me. So how do I maintain my mental health? I think about the day's event as if I'm a person observing myself and. If I need to change, I change. If I need to apologise, I apologise. I have no regrets, because every day I will say the things that I need to say. Uh, with the medication, their condition can be controlled. He used to hear voices saying that he's not capable in certain things, he's lousy, he's, he's bad. But he told me recently that he stayed with me, uh, no such voices talking to him. Well, I think he's recovering, that's about all. Yep. Man, my sister got a lot of power. She's a big, big, clever one. She's speaking number one. Oh, she, she <laughs> said I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm powerful. <laughs> um, have you felt like a burden? Um, consistently, for many, many years, I felt like a burden. I'm not earning a salary. I'm not, um, I'm not being able to do household chores very well because I'm always very unwell. In some sense, I feel that they can be better without me. The thing about feeling a burden is also a driving force as well because I always think that back then, I said that one day, I'm going to pay back to them. I don't know whether that will happen. No, but, she uh, bought me ice cream. I love yeah. ice cream. <laughs> so I think it's a driving motivation that I will be you know, a productive member of the family kind of thing. I never thought that I would be an overseas scholar. I never thought that I would come to a point that I can be, you know, so secured, you know. I do have people who, you know, who told me that they, they are in denial of their condition. After knowing me, they decided that, okay, I can accept my diagnosis. I can be like Faith. They said, I want to be like Faith. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to be that someone. Uh. I wish he's more normal, but I, I think with his kind of weird character, that's why he can paint. He said he want to uh, get Nobel Prize. Jiang. Wow. <laughs> he's quite fine, just a bit weird, and he he's talkative. Cannot speak like chicken backside. <laughs> he said he cannot speak like chicken backside. <laughs> My friend did this. Just this four letter word that gets me through, which is hope. This, this condition makes you feel like you're alone. But actually, I had my, my moments where I reflected and I realised, you know what, I was never alone. I had my two boys and my, my wife fighting alongside me. We self-published a book called The Boy Who Hated the Sun. You know? There's a sy synopsis inside that, in which I clearly mentioned that I had bipolar. And the reason I did that was because I wanted people who bought the book to know that this was written by somebody with bipolar, you know. So don't, like I said earlier on, don't let your, your the label define you. You're more than that. What is the one change you hope to see in society? 
protect me, change my behavior to be a new kid, a new world, harmony, Madura Singapore. People with mental illness, we only need to be patient and speak to them slowly and we try to understand them. I think everybody can, can um, heal if they are given a, a more caring and loving uh, environment. We don't have anything back then, we have nothing back then and now we have almost everything. You want to have job rehab, you have somewhere to go, psychologist is easily accessible. I think the only thing that I hope to see is uh, you know, the discrimination against um, people with mental health conditions when it comes to looking for jobs. A lot of people are scared to look for jobs, not because the job is scary, but because there is a line that you have to declare. It's like a uh, catch-22. Like, if I write down, they will reject me for interview. If I don't write down, I got the job, and I got caught, I would be caught for lying. Humanity has too much mindlessness and too little mindfulness. Perceptions have to change. La. It will take you a while, you know, to reach that point where you can say, you know what, damn, I embrace it all. I embrace my imperfections, so what? I don't care what people think of me. Do you love your caregiver? I, I do. I love my sister because she's my only mommy. Nobody can take care if you can take care of me. You could tell her I love you before? Never say that. No, I can't see him. <laughs> yeah, he's... So many guys are so bad. He's so big. I mean... He's taking care of many... many or who probably know who Singapore people is. No, not who Singapore people. No, no, no. All, all admire. All admire of my sister. His way of showing love is different. He likes to go out and buy food. Um, and certainly he'll buy food that he likes. So in case I don't want to eat, he can eat. He's very yeah, clever, no, right? Uh, He's very clever, uh, right? Okay, I cannot believe my... I think, in some sense, um, my family always have this um, very conservative kind of view, like they don't talk that much. My sister never really asks, how are you, kind of thing. Adrian actually always asks, how are you doing? You know, how's your new job? How's everything? And I think I, I love him for that because uh, I appreciate conversations and he become like someone who actually started all this conversation. I mean, they're us. They, they just have uh, an additional card dealt to them. In the face of those challenges, she has uh, come out on top. I mean, my, my challenges pale in comparison to what she has faced, like, you know. So I'm proud to be associated with her, like, you know. Associated? I'm like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is my sister-in-law, the genius. Like, hey, I'm the brother-in-law. <laughs> She's my dark phoenix. <laughs> no. <laughs> she's my Jean Grey. Um, I wouldn't just say she's just a caregiver. She's more beyond that. Beyond even being a wife. You know? I think most importantly, she's been my, my friend. You know, all these years. That's all you need. Like, I appreciate not the big things that you do, all the little things that you do. You care for me. She does. I can be a b too. Dad, I mean, that goes without saying. But, <laughs> but you know what? I am the luckiest guy. <laughs>